The following is for information purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. All opinions and views expressed by the contributors to this podcast are in a personal capacity only. They do not represent the views of Progressive Equity Research or any other organization mentioned in this podcast. Okay, so it is Thursday, 24th of October. Welcome back, Jeremy. Good to have you here. Hi, Gareth. Good to be here. This time last week, you said there was going to be no news of any importance at the macro level. And it feels like it's been roughly right. Nothing too dramatic. You're saying it's more political this week than economic. Yeah, I think the main factors this week are political. We've got looming events both in the US and the UK with the presidential election and the UK budget both fast approaching. We've also this week had the IMF stirring the pot and we've also had some rather unhelpful government borrowing figures for Rachel Reeves to ponder along with everything else that she's got on her plate at the moment. And it does look as though, along with the budget, we're going to be getting a change of the fiscal rules, so more borrowing. And this, unsurprisingly, has caused a fair bit of volatility in markets, particularly in bond markets. The strategist Ed Yardini summed it up very well when he said that the bond vigilantes were out voting early in the elections. They'd made their minds up. Yeah, and we've had US Treasury bond yields rising further this week. They're up 63 basis points since the Fed's September meeting. So in a month when we were surprised with the Fed's decision to cut rates by 50 basis points, the 10-year yield has gone up more than that. So hence a steepening of the yield curve of some proportion. What do you think that means? What, what's driving that and what might it mean for people? I think it means a couple of things, but particularly it means they feel that Fed Chair Powell's dovish monetary stance is risky in a hot environment and that this confluence of events raises the risk that the US economy will overheat. But it also is flagging a concern that no matter which party wins in a couple of weeks' time, the fiscal policies that the US government is currently running are a problem and they're going to land on the doormat of the next administration that is going to be facing interest payments of a trillion dollars a year and a ballooning federal deficit. Unsurprisingly in all this, we're getting a fair bit of financial market volatility in both bonds and currencies. So amidst all this, The dollar is now up 4% in the last month. So the DXY is now trading up through the 104 level. And that's with longer term interest rates rising, the the dollar rising on the back of that. And so what you've got is essentially the bond market saying that inflation might not be dead. The US economy is doing better than the Fed has been leading us to believe. So inflation might need further action in terms of higher interest rates. And higher interest rates is what you'd want to charge anyway, because you're not sure whether the US government's able to pay its bills. So there's a premium there that debt's too high and growing. Yeah. Yes. Understood. In terms of the US federal deficit, they're able to set the short term, the Fed funds rate with relative ease. They're able to choose that rate for themselves. But obviously, over the longer term, the bond markets or bond investors will set the yield curve depending on what they're prepared to pay for longer term dated bonds or gilts. The rates that the US government pays, presumably, is it a blend of those things? Or what what are the rates they actually pay for the debt that they have out there? Well, that's an active decision by the US Treasury Department, run by Janet Yellen, to determine the structure, the term structure of their debt. And they do that by issuing bonds at different stages along the yield curve, anything from one year or less, right the way out to 30-year maturity bonds. But the further you get out along the yield curve, the more the market determines the rate. So somewhere between 5 and 15 years, normally the 10-year bond is where the action happens. And that's why most people refer in shorthand to the reference bond being the 10-year bond. 
Yeah, that's the one we always hear about. So, okay, that, that makes sense. It's a very topical subject because Dr. Doom himself, Mr. Nuriel Rabini, has recently written a paper accusing the US Treasury of active bond issuance. And one of the things that has been notable about the US bond market in recent times is they're actively issuing short-term bonds, usually called treasury bills, that are all maturing shortly after this election. So they mature between the fourth quarter of this year and the first and second quarters of next year. So again, the can has been kicked down the road quite literally in terms of bond management and bond financing. So yeah, this is a critical point and one that I think the bond investors are showing their concern over. So they've had the short-term benefit of being able to enjoy the short-dated part of the yield curve, i.e. the lower rates as they are now, for the last few months or the last year or two, but the bills for that are going to start falling due quite soon after the election. Exactly. Those bills need refinancing, and one would assume that the duration of the newly issued paper will be longer term. Yeah. So that trillion dollars a year of interest costs might even start to edge up rather than down. I think if you look at the current structure, it almost certainly will go up and that the degree to which monetary policy controls what the Treasury pays in the ongoing cost of financing its debt is limited ultimately. Yeah. Meanwhile, the IMF have been warning us that there might be some market risks out there. Yeah. They termed it a growing disconnect between financial markets and elevated risk levels, i.e. they're concerned that the equity market is not paying enough attention to what's causing concern among the bond vigilantes at the moment and the implications of some of the imbalances out there in global markets and the global economy. Within all that, the IMF have reported on and updated their forecasts for the world economy and its constituent parts. And within that, the UK is actually one of the very few economies where they've upgraded their forecast and they've underlined their growth figure for 2025. So the UK is now back in the pack of economic growth for the rest of this year and looking into next year. Doesn't really feel like that, but that's just fine. Yeah. We'll take it. And meanwhile, of course, we've got the budget next week. And I think the big feature in the UK market this week along with other types of sort of kite flying of what we might expect in the budget, we're getting particular alarm in the AIM market. Ahead of the budget, we've seen the AIM All Share Index now down some 10% over the last couple of months, with a discernible negative trend in recent weeks among some of the more popular shares owned by the AIM IHT funds or schemes there have been several small cap fund managers out there saying that they see buying opportunities over the next week's budget due to this influence because the concern here is that they will either amend or disallow the business relief on owning AIM shares in portfolios that have been typically constructed to avoid paying inheritance tax. Yes, it's a big talking point. We'll have to wait and see. Obviously, we'll know by this time next week what the answer is. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think if you can identify aim listed shares that have been unexpectedly weak over the last month or so, that have strong balance sheets and critically got the ability to buy back their own shares in any market sell off, I think that's probably a sensible strategy to adopt over the budget next week. Oh, fingers crossed the, the budget is not too ruthless and, and we might see a, a bit of a bounce either way. So, yeah. What about you? What have you been seeing in the market this week? So we've had news from a couple of progressive clients. Gear for Music, which is the online retailer of musical instruments and musical equipment. They had a, a trading update for their H1 period. Overall, it's it pretty good. They've had quarterly performances has moved from Q1 with a minus 4% revenue outcome compared to the prior year to Q2, where it's gone to plus one. So they've seen some quite nice move quarter on quarter, and they're able to reduce their debt at the same time. So there's some signs of, of improvement and stability and growth coming through within Gear for Music. Good to see. And then Through Vision, who are a provider of, of walkthrough security technology, 
they had H1 results published. They've had a, a very strong performance from their retail and logistics business, which is where they're providing security technology for mainly distribution warehouses of these large sheds, as they call them, making sure the employees aren't stealing stock or goods in transit through those warehouses. That's been going very nicely. They are still struggling on the customs side and the border protection side, especially in the States where they've had previously some quite significant revenues from the US government. But overall, the business is doing not too badly and they're starting to benefit significantly from the new partnership approach they've put in place. So that, that's all good. So those were the progressive names reporting news this week. Um, how about more broadly? Have you seen anything else from other UK stocks? It's been a busy week for company announcements. So I noticed that franchise brands said it was considering moving from AIM to the main market, which follows progressive stock Gamma Communications and Alpha Group talking just now about the AIM market and some of the issues around the AIM market, some of the larger constituents are making a concerted effort to uh, move to the main market. And I think franchise brands would probably make a good main market constituent. Morgan Sindel, they updated that their partnership housing profits will exceed previous expectations and its fit out business where it was competing with ISG, which got into trouble a few weeks ago. That's trading significantly ahead of expectations. So Morgan Sindel really standing out in the building and construction area. And yeah, it was another busy week for uh, Mike Ashley as well. Last week, he was trying to get inside Mulberry handbags and uh, was rebuffed by Mulberry and its largest shareholder. This week, Fraser's announced that they are requisitioning an EGM to try and get Mike Ashley on the board of Boohoo, where they are now the largest shareholder with a 27% stake. Yes, another busy week for Mike Ashley, although I'm, sh I'm sure he doesn't have many quiet weeks, but a busy fortnight for him. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And what have we got to look forward to next week? Well, it's um, Jobs Week in the US this week. So we get the JOLTS openings data on Tuesday. There's a few other things going on of some consequence. We get the Eurozone GDP data on Wednesday, which should show a pickup in the year-on-year -year rate from 0.6% to 1%. But I suspect within that, eyes will be on the German figures, which will be out the same day, which is forecast to see a modest pickup from last month's flat GDP data. But given some of the news around and what the IMF was saying, I think that figure could be negative, And certainly that's going to be of note. We also get US GDP data next week on Wednesday as well, which should see a small decline, but still running around the 3% year on year level. So still moving along strongly. And clearly, that's a notable figure in terms of where we are on the inflation and interest rate calculations that uh, the market is trying to make at the moment. And we get euro area inflation data on Thursday as well. And I suspect we'll see a figure broadly in line with last month's 1.7% figure comfortably below the 2% mark. And I think deflation and recession is the fear for Europe rather than increasing inflation, I would argue. And then to round off the week on Friday, we get the non-farm payroll lottery. So as you <laughs> recall, last month, we got the knockout 254,000 new jobs created in the US economy, which was way ahead where anybody expected it to be. Clearly, with the US election coming up in two weeks' time, this number could be very consequential, and we'll get the unemployment figure as well, along with the uh, non-farm payroll figure. So a shocker, you know, a very low number. And I think that's just going to be a case of um, light blue touch paper and stand back, because I think that's going to be fuel to the fire for Donald Trump. Yeah, he'd certainly be using it aggressively against Kamala Harris and the Democrats, wouldn't he, if there's a weak jobs number? Yeah. Fine. Okay. Well, let's look forward to there. And, and obviously in the UK, our, the highlight will be the budget. So uh, of course, yeah. Budget on Wednesday. We'll be able to dissect that and see what Rachel Reeves has, has achieved for us all. So fingers crossed it's all good and look forward to catching up then. Okay. See you then. Talk to you then. Bye. Brought to you by Progressive Equities.